Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time again that you continue just to give to us, to, to dedicate to spending time in your word, to spending time here in this wonderful book of Romans that you've given to us, this letter from Paul that we continue just to study and, and see how it applies to our lives, even to this day. And so God, as we dive into this passage here, would you open up our hearts? Would you continue to, again, just bestow your Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us, on me as I bring forth the word? Again, would you let it be from you? And let your Holy Spirit rest on each and every person listening to this. Again, whether now or sometime in the future, let let your Spirit rest upon them and, and invoke change and, and invoke conviction and, and invoke a heart for you, God. Let us all just continue to strive towards being more like your son, coming into a relationship with you of, of understanding what that means. And ultimately, again, as this book will teach us of, of what your gospel means to each and every one of us and why we should be so passionate to carry it to the ends of the earth. And so God, again, we thank you for this morning that we have. We thank you for this time. And we just do all of these. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So oftentimes, I think here in America, we look at sports and we value the competitiveness and that killer instinct most of, of things that push us to win above all other things, right? But in Europe, there's actually an organization that values the kindness and competitive and, and, and the kindness rather over the competitiveness. It's the International Committee for Fair Play, or the acronym for it is CIFP. And it, it awards athletes who demonstrate remarkable acts of kindness in the spirit of a fair competition. They give out awards regardless of, of gender, of fame, or of age. For example, like the very first award they gave was back in 1965 to bobsledder Eugenio Monti in the 1964 Winter Olympics. See, Eugenio and his partner, they had just finished their bobsled run and they set the leading time to beat. And the team that they were most worried about was coming up right after them. And as that team was getting into position, they noticed that a crucial part on their sled was broken. And then without hesitation, Eugenio took that part from his sled and he handed it to the other team so that they could take off. They were able to, to start their run without delay or penalty. And it turns out that that team went to set the record for that year and they won the gold medal. And here's some other stories that we have from the CIFP more recently. Amateur soccer player Fabio Caramel was recognized for his actions when he gave up playing with his team so that he could voluntarily donate bone marrow to a completely unknown patient who was in critical condition. Hockey player Aysen Panhu was playing in the championship match in, with his team, and he scored the tying goal, but then he went to the referee and told him, no, you have to cancel that because the goal didn't actually hit inside the net. It somehow hit the outside and the sensors just went off. He showed that it was more important that honesty was valued over just simply winning. And then the last one here was from Rodolfo Carrer, who was a rally driver who saw a competitor stuck off road. And instead of passing him like all the other competitors did, he, he stopped and he pulled over and got his tow cable out and helped that car get back on the road to finish the race instead of giving up off road as he was originally set up to. See, all of these things are, are what we often phrase here in America as random acts of kindness that these competitors chose to show kindness to someone they oftentimes didn't really even know and were competing against. And, and ultimately, that didn't matter, that they showed kindness beyond all things. And, and today, the reason I bring all this up is because in Romans, we're going to see Paul writing words of kindness to, again, to a group that he had no idea of, that he had never met once in his entire life. And so again, we are continuing our series, Romans, and I've, I've subtitled this series, Righteousness Revealed, because what we will continue to see throughout this entire letter is how God's righteousness is revealed to us through Jesus Christ. And if you happen to miss the first message last week, then you'll, well, you're blessed in that we have YouTube and that you can just go back and watch this afterwards. And I, I would highly recommend that you do, but in case if you don't get a chance to, or just so we can understand everything happening now, here's just a real quick recap of the first seven verses. In those seven verses, Paul introduces himself to the church in Rome, because again, this is a group that he's never met before. And, and with most of the letters that we have from Paul to the churches, 
are our churches that he planted. And he tells us in this one in particular that he is a permanent messenger of the gospel of God, not of man's gospel, but of God's gospel. And it's this gospel that surrounds all of Jesus Christ, who is fully man and fully God. And it's through Jesus that God has given Paul the authority to preach on the obedience that comes from faith and proclaiming Jesus across the world. And it's this example that we should be following, right? That our purpose is to be the same as Paul's, to be a messenger who proclaims Jesus across the world. And so this morning, we'll pick it up and we'll continue in verse 8. And so let me go ahead and just read the entire passage, and then we'll go back and kind of pick it apart verse by verse. So verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. That takes us all the way to verse 13. And so the the first thing that I want to point out here in verse 8 at the very beginning was that Rome and these churches here were, were popular by their faith. That Paul starts by thanking God for the faith of these churches in Rome that is proclaimed throughout the world. See, Paul is telling us here that their faith is known throughout all of Rome. But also take note here that Paul is writing to this church, to these churches even in Rome, as if he's been longtime friends with them, that he's been like their best friend for life. But again, keep in mind, Paul has never met these people, but he still shows love to them and he is still thankful for them. You see, when we take a look at Rome, Rome was essentially the center of the world at this time. Rome was the capital and is still the capital of Italy, but it was also the business epicenter that everyone in some way, shape, or form interacted with Rome. And what Paul is telling us here is that in their interactions with Rome, while they were doing business at Rome, they heard about the faith of these churches here in Rome. And they went out and they told the rest of the world that, hey, there's a church in Rome that is proclaiming these things. Because see, in the first century, Rome was predominantly a polytheistic culture. They worshiped all kinds of gods, and and many of those gods are are what we have as the names of the planets that we have today, like Mars, Jupiter, Mercury. These were all gods that they worshipped. But it wasn't just these gods. They also worshipped the Caesars, the emperors, as gods as well. And basically, for Roman citizens, they didn't care who you worshipped as long as you didn't tell them you couldn't worship their gods. And so for Christianity to come along and say that, no, All of these other gods, your Caesar, everything else is wrong. That was not only insulting to their religions, it was insulting to their governments and to all of their societies, everything that they did. And despite all of this and the persecution that these churches underwent, they still believed and Paul heard of the faith that these Roman churches were having, that they were proclaiming Jesus above all else. And I think that something else that we need to take note of here is that Paul shows appreciation for the churches in these Rome, in the churches in Rome because of the size of their faith here, not specifically because of the size of their church. And what I mean by that is I think for us today, it's it's easy for us to kind of get caught up in thinking of like, oh, look at how that church over there looks, or or look at the one down the street over there, or look at that mega church over there. And it's especially true in our day and age with this age of internet that we're in, that you can just click and you can see massive mega churches across the U.S. and across the world. See, Rome here was not a great place to be as a Christian. Again, because of the persecution that they went through, these churches would have been meeting in in people's houses or even in secret, like underground or in caves. They didn't have giant auditoriums like we do today. They don't have multi-million dollar facilities like some of these other churches do. These churches in Rome were, were committed first and foremost 
to loving Jesus, and they were committed to telling others about what Jesus had done. And they were known throughout the world because of the size of their faith, not because of the size of their church or the size of their auditorium or anything else. They were known for their faith. And and as we continue into verse 9 here, in the first part, it says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. The second point that I want to make here from this passage is that we're called to serve, that Paul served God through the power of Jesus Christ, through his calling from Jesus Christ. This is Paul serving. And this, again, should be the attitude that we as followers of Jesus Christ continue to emulate as well, that our faith should ultimately drive us to serve. And and if we think of our faith kind of like water, I think there are three different ways that we can react when this faith comes into us. We could either be one, like a swamp, that when water flows into a swamp, the swamp just simply holds on to it, right? And because the water doesn't go anywhere, these swamps, the the water starts to get dirty, and then things start to grow inside this water, and and it starts to become unclean, and it starts to become just bad, and only bad things grow in these swamp waters. And even as you look at swamps, swamps are not exactly places that people want to go to vacation to. They're, They're dark, and they're disturbing places. So you can be a swamp if you just let the water flow in you and stay in you. And then on the complete other side of that, you could be a desert. You could choke this water off from ever entering into you. And and things that are in the desert, they don't grow because there isn't water there to feed it. And the things that do grow, again, those tend to be things that, that people don't want. And in the same way, deserts are desolate places. No one wants to get lost in a desert. No one wants to go there for, for picnics or for vacations. So instead of a swamp or instead of a desert, we should be like mighty rivers. Our faith should flow into us and then continue out of us, that we would continue to provide water to those to drink, that life swims through and thrives throughout the rivers that we have, that these rivers that we are 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 there to place one another around everybody and to provide benefits to those around us, that when faith enters into us, we should let that faith flow out of us and flow around us and serve the people near us. And that's what Paul is saying here in this first part of 9, that we are called to serve, that our faith should flow through us and serve those around us, that by faith in Jesus Christ, that's what we're called to. And that's what Paul is doing here in this letter that he is writing to encourage, he's writing to teach, and he's writing to serve the churches in Rome. And for us today, serving can take many forms. Maybe it's helping a coworker out who's, who's in the weeds and struggling. Or maybe it's loving your spouse when they're telling you about their problems and instead of trying to fix them, you just listen. Or maybe it's teaching your kids what it means to truly be a follower of Christ, not just in the words that you speak, but also in the actions that you do. Or maybe if you're with your siblings, you let them have the last cookie or dessert, whatever it is, even though you maybe wanted it too. Or maybe it's even just looking outside and seeing your neighbor's trash can and taking it back for them because it fell over into the street and you don't want it to be damaged. Serving doesn't have to be these huge gestures. They don't have to be these gigantic things. But oftentimes, a series of small actions can show large love to the people around us. And I think that's, again, our mission here at West Houston, that we want to serve and to grow hearts for for Jesus, his people, and his world. And by being saved by Jesus Christ, we are called to serve his people. And if you look around and and you look at this word serve that we find here, when you look through the rest of the New Testament and you you find in other places, it's often translated as worship. And so ultimately what we see here is that for us to serve is for us to worship God. Worshiping God is serving God. Now, as we continue through in the back half of verse 9 and it continues into verse 10, it reads, Without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. The third thing that I think we take from this passage is that we're to pray for others. We read here that Paul is constantly praying for the churches in Rome, that he is lifting up a group of people that, again, he's never met before. 
right? And this is so countercultural to what we do today that so often we're, we're caught up in the things that we need. We're caught up in the things that, that we, we want even, and that we forget to think about those around us. We forget even as Christians to pray for those around us. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you can't pray for things that you need, that God even calls us to, that we're to pray for our daily bread. That's what Jesus told us to, that when we pray for our daily bread, we're to pray daily for the things that we need. But Paul here reminds us that it's also important that we lift up the prayers of those around us. That it's important that we continue to consider and love those around us. And in fact, this actually reminds me of a quote from from D.L. Moody, who was a Christian evangelist during the 1800s. D.L. Moody said that I must speak to God about men before I speak to men about God. D.L. Moody recognized here that praying to God about others is the very first step in telling people about Jesus Christ. It's the very first step in evangelism, but it's also a major step in our desire for community as well. That again, we should be praying for one another consistently and constantly. This is what Paul is doing for this group in this letter. And it's the very reason that at the end of our Bible studies, you will constantly see me asking what are prayer requests that we can pray for one another. And at the same time, you'll see me typing these into my phone so that ultimately during the week, I can continue to look back on this and I can continue to pray for us during the week because I can't remember everything that happens and I can't remember all of it. And I want to be praying for you. We need to be reminded that it's important for us to pray for other people. And that is exactly what Paul is telling us here. Now, in this last section, we we hear of some of Paul's motivation as to why he wants to come to Rome, and it's ultimately to proclaim the gospel, and it was something I mentioned in the first seven verses as well, but he mentions it here in verses 11 through 13. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. See here in verse 11 and 12, Paul says that he wants to give a spiritual gift. And just to be clear, this isn't the same type of spiritual gift that we see in 1 Corinthians. Paul isn't saying that he's the Holy Spirit and that he's going to give them gifts from God. It's more likely that Paul is is writing here to say that he wants to bring his own spiritual gift of evangelism to the churches here in Rome, and he wants to strengthen them and encourage them and be encouraged by their gift even of evangelism. See, you could think of it like like this. If, If, think about something that you're really good at, right? Think about something that you maybe are better than other people at or that you really enjoy. Maybe it's a a particular subject in school, or maybe it's a particular instrument, or or maybe it's a sport that you play. And then when when you're doing it, when you come across somebody who's equally as good as you at it, you encourage each other, you challenge each other, you strengthen each other in this competition, in this camaraderie of this, this thing that you're good at together. And that is what Paul is looking to do here. He wants to evangelize and strengthen a group and be strengthened by them as well. And then finally, in the last verse that we have here, verse 13, Paul reassures the Roman churches that he wants to come to Rome and that before he's been trying, but so far hasn't been successful. But his reasoning for wanting to come and and the reason why he still will eventually come is that he wants to reach souls alongside the Roman churches. That if anyone was capable of proclaiming the gospel on their own, it would have been Paul. Paul, again, was this theological giant, and even in today's standards, Paul could just stay home and just write letters and write books and and do all kinds of things by himself, and we would be greatly blessed by it. But instead of doing those things by himself, he goes out and does good with others. Paul says that his desire is to proclaim the gospel alongside the people of Rome. And so, as I bring this all kind of to a close, I, I started out talking about these random acts of kindness. But what kinds of acts of kindness are, are you thinking of? What could you do? What is the greatest act of kindness that we could do? For me, I think the greatest one that I can think of is, is introducing somebody to, 
Jesus Christ, that the greatest act of kindness anyone can do is to tell somebody of how God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that they would have the opportunity to be with God for all eternity if they simply put their faith in the resurrection of his son. And that's, that's what's on the table for you this morning, that if you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, then know that he is calling out to you this morning, that he is here with you as you're watching this video. He wants this relationship. He is seeking after you today. And all you have to do is, is, is accept what he's already extended to you. And if that's, if that's you this morning, then the question that I have for you here is, is would you reach out to us? Would you contact us? We, we would love to come alongside you and partner with you. And, and our email is in the description. We would, again, just love to hear from you. Or if you have questions and you're just not sure, then reach out to us and we'd love to discuss those things with you. And for those of you who are already walking with Jesus or you know somebody who's already walking with Jesus, then, then what do those random acts of kindness mean for you? I think acting in kindness to those who follow Jesus is encouraging them to walk with Christ, to continue that journey. It means following in Paul's footsteps. It's, it's living a life, being known by our faith. It's recognizing that we're called to serve one another. It's constantly and consistently praying for those around you. And ultimately, it's proclaiming the gospel to the very ends of the earth. It's, it's in doing all of these things while encouraging those around you to do the very same thing. Because these small acts of kindness today, they may not be significant to the world. They may not be things that they value in the world. But our God sees those acts and he delights and he loves people who love him and love his people. And so that's, that's what Paul is telling us here as we continue in this first half of chapter 1. That Paul is delighted to be here. That Paul is excited to be here. And Paul is yearning to travel to Rome so that he can proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. He is longing to do more random acts of kindness. And so I, I implore you and I encourage even myself as we go forward from this day that we can do these random acts of kindness. That we can tell people of Jesus Christ. And that we can come before one another as followers of Jesus Christ and encourage one another to be his disciples, to follow after him and to proclaim him and to serve him and to love him and to love his people. And so I hope and I pray that that was you and that that's still you here in the future and that you still continue to be encouraged by this letter. And as we continue just going through this, that you just fall deeper in love with the gospel and with Jesus as we just continue to open up the rest of the letter of Romans. So would you pray with me now? Father, again, we just continue to thank you for this letter that you've given to us. That as we continue to open it up and as we continue to develop, as we continue to read through it, that you would tell us who you say that we are. That it's by your gospel that we are saved. That it's by your son that we are saved. That it's putting our faith in your son that we are brought into eternity. That we are brought into eternal salvation with you, God. And so would you continue to invoke that change within us? Would you continue to remind us of your grace and of your goodness? And would you move in people's hearts that if they haven't made that commitment yet, would you continue to just bestow your Holy Spirit upon them and let them know that you love them and that you care for them and you are yearning and seeking after them? And again, would you continue to encourage us who are following after you? Would you continue to remind us that even when we fall, even when we don't act the way that we know we should act, that your grace extends further still? And that we can continue to come around one another and encourage each other in that same way. That we can continue to build each other up, that we can continue to be the church that you have called us to be. Not because of the size of our building, not because of how great our sound system is or how great anything is that we have done, but ultimately because of how great our faith is in you and how great you are. So God, again, we, we love you. We, we continue to pursue you. We continue to just dedicate our lives to everything that you are. And God, we just continue to ask that you continue to open up our hearts, open up our minds, and lead us into your everlasting grace. So we do these and we pray these all in Jesus' name. Amen.